The following interview was conducted uh, with Jill May, Professor of Literacy and Language Curric Curriculum in, in the Department of Curriculum Instruction in the College of Education for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, January 14, 2011, at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Program. Welcome. Thank Still, you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. I was born in, in Rocky Ford, Colorado, and my father at that time owned a ranch near Denver. So I'm I don't I was thinking about it. I don't know why my mother had both myself and my brother in Rocky Ford. Later they moved there and he owned an implement business and we lived there while I was growing up until I was in the, the fifth grade. And then we moved to Wisconsin, and I went in Rocky Ford to a regular little school. I remember my kindergarten teacher was the principal's wife, and I remember she played music for nap time, and he tiptoed in and told us to be quiet and not let her know we were, that he was there, and he closed all the drapes. And, you know, we all thought that was so clever of him, but of course she knew. <laughs> <laughs> that that was the, uh, that you was get a different hand on it when you talk about it now, right? I yeah, that. now I know. But also, my third grade teacher when I was in Colorado uh, was probably my most exciting teacher. I don't remember a thing that she did except she went on a cruise in the summer and her ship went down and she drowned in the ship. And she was the most popular teacher with all of us little kids because we could say, oh, I had her before she went down in the ship. So that was uh, the excitement of Colorado. I don't remember much about my school in Colorado other than that. But I went to Eau Claire. My dad traded his business for a farm in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Um, he, his business was just giving him ulcers and it was too much work, uh, people coming at all hours. And so he traded it and we moved to this nice farm, large farm in, in Wisconsin. And We're about in Wisconsin. Eau Claire. Um, okay. And um, I went to four, a four-room school then. I went, uh, it was first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. It might have been s seventh and eighth were together, so maybe it was third, fourth, and then fifth, sixth. And it was great for me because I learned to study when people were talking and doing things because there was always one class reciting while the other class did their homework or their studying. And I remember that school had a hill and we sled down it in the winter and we played baseball in the summer and it was, uh, it was a fun experience going to that school. And then I was, took the bus into Eau Claire to the high school once I hit high school age. Actually, for one year I went to the junior high because we didn't have ninth grade and the high school was 10, 11, 12, so yeah, I went one year. Tell us a about high school. Any teachers uh, or Yeah, program? high school was uh, a good time for me. Um, I, it was a bad time too, because it's a good time and a bad time for everybody. Um, but it was a good time for me. I was uh, in a journalism class, and the journalism teacher was also my history teacher, and I told Bob my favorite story about that was Mr. Frisbee, one day I had my hand up and he called on me and I said, oh, I don't, I don't have anything to say, I don't know, and he said to the history class, that's why I put Jill in the back, she waves at me all the time, hi Jill, I don't know if she wants to answer a question or she's just waving, and I remember I loved him uh, as a history teacher, but I also loved him as a journalism teacher. I was the uh, associate editor of the newspaper my senior year in high school. I also was in debate. My brother was a really good debater. I was a decent debater. Um, not really great, but okay. And then I suppose the most exciting thing I did in high school, I was in theater and actually decided to major in theater when I went to college. But the most exciting thing I suppose I did that was I became the school mascot. Um, I was Old Abe, the mighty eagle, and I had an eagle mache head, and I wore these funny little clothes. And um, for the games and stuff. Yes. Oh and when, <laughs> my! I did it my senior year. You missed your calling. Here yeah, I did. And then um, they went to the basketball tournament in in Madison. We didn't have a lot of money, uh, but my dad knew that when I wore that thing, I got really, really hot. And he knew that all the other kids, when the thing was over, except this one little pathetic boy who dated me, all disappeared, you know. And so he said, you don't need to do that in Madison because we'll pay your way. And so we all took the, the train down 
and went to Madison in the spring. And I remember that and thinking Madison was really neat. I went to college, though, at Eau Claire. I had thought I wanted to go to Gustavus Adolphus up in Minnesota. But to be honest, my brother had a full scholarship to college. and At he, that school? No, at River Falls, Black okay. River Falls. And um, he was 17 when he went to college. He wouldn't be 18 until November, and he quit school. So my dad had this idea that if we... If I stayed at home, I would make it through college. And so he really didn't want me to go away. And um, so, so I went. you to, lived at home? I lived at home until my senior year. And then I lived in an apartment with another young woman. Um, yeah, and, and I worked when I was in college. At first, I worked, I worked in high school in a flower shop. I loved it. I remember the man, Frank Goodovich, said, you don't run in a flower shop. You'll break the pedals. You have to learn to work quickly and decisively and not break the petals of the flowers. And so I learned how to walk quickly without running and we'll always watch what was, so you do learn something good. And I worked, uh, then when I went to college, I quit that job because it was very demanding. Every time there was a wedding, I had to work on Friday night. And if there was a dance, I had to make all the corsages there. And uh, when there was a wedding, I went to the wedding and pinned the flowers on the mothers and made sure the bride and all the attendants had the flowers right. So um, it took my Saturdays and my Fridays away oh, from yeah, me. Right. Yeah. So I quit and I worked at a dress shop and, um, and I liked that a lot. And, and I also worked um, at the newspaper. I got a job at the newspaper on the society page. I once ran the wrong girl's wedding picture under her wedding, and I heard, stop the presses, <laughs> and they had to switch them around. Luckily, somebody knew her. Otherwise, we would have had a real mess. And I stayed and took the obituaries at night sometimes. Uh, so I'd do the day page at night. This is the local paper. Local paper, Eau Claire paper, yeah. And I worked there, oh, I would say through my junior year. Uh-huh. And, and I stayed at the dress shop through college, but my I somewhere along the line, it would have probably been my junior year, um, the speech teacher decided she really liked me, which is pretty funny because she didn't like me at all the first time she met me when I was in theater, but she totally forgot. And she wanted me to be on the debate squad, and she thought I was brilliant. And she, she always used me as her model, and she got me a job. She got me a job as the storyteller for the public library. And the public library had 100 children every Saturday for story hour. So, uh, yeah. So I remember the guy said to me, the head librarian, and he was the stereotypic head librarian. He was very mousy, very shy, everything you read about, right? And when he hired me, he didn't do eye contact, but he said to me, can you project loud enough for 100 children to hear you? And I said, oh, yes, I can do that. Well, he was one of those lurkers in the stacks. Katie, you know those, those guys? And about a month later, he came and said, uh, we can hear you in the library all the time. <laughs> Would you please not talk when you're at the desk except when you're doing work? So I said, okay. I don't know if I didn't talk. But I worked there all through college. Um, and... I ran the summer reading program because the woman who was in charge of the children's room was elderly and she really, I'm not sure she liked children anymore and so she certainly didn't like the summer reading program. Was it a good sized library? For a yeah, small it was town? a good sized library. A couple, I, couple I, floors perhaps? Oh yeah, and, oh, yeah. And, and, and I loved the library but when I was a kid we, I never got to use the library because that was when if you lived in the city limits you could use the library. But if you lived in the county, you had to pay a fee. And my dad just wouldn't pay yeah. $25 a year. It sounds like nothing now, but it was a lot in, then. In those days, that's yes, a lot. Yeah. Sure. And right. so when I was in high school, my mom worked downtown. She was a secretary, executive secretary for a builder. And I would walk from high school downtown, and there was a bookstore. And so I read all the British classics. I would buy them in paperback and then read them, because I couldn't get library books. But, but we did have a, a card one year, because that's when I read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. And it made a huge impact on me. I know that, because um, I read it again and again as I grew older. But um, 
so I, I hadn't been in the library a lot before I got that job, Kate. I had been in it, but not a lot. And it is, it was, if you have 100 kids coming to Story Hour, it has to be a fairly yeah. large size library. And it rebuilt. a good size crowd. Yeah, and it rebuilt. It was the second floor. Uh, there must have been a meeting room in the second floor. I just remember it was the second floor. And they redid the library, and they put the children's room, where do they always put it? In the basement, right? With a, a separate entrance once we moved. And I remember that was when Where the Wild Things came out when I was in college. And that librarian hid the book. She said that it was just too frightening and that if any child wanted to read it, they would have to ask for it by name or by author. Well, what four-year-old knows where the wild, you know, so they didn't take it out. And one of my favorite teachers in college was a man named Dr. Moore. He and his wife, John Moore, and I don't remember her name, but they were both on the faculty, and I loved him. Um, I thought he was just wonderful. He was the head of the English department, and I had her, and I thought she was wonderful, too. She told me I couldn't spell at all, and she wasn't going to let me graduate if I didn't learn to spell, so... She gave me spelling rules to memorize. And I, I don't know that it really helped, but it helped a little. And because uh, I'd learned to read in Dick and Jane, and so you don't know phonics. So you don't know how to sound words out. If you haven't seen it, you don't know how to write it, you know. But anyway, I had him take that book home, and he laughed and said, Jill, now you know I would let my kids read Lolita if they could read it. So I'm a bad example, but he took it home, and they all loved Where the Wild Things Are. So I know that I was working there at that time when the book was uh, first, and I know the impact it had. Librarians and teachers thought it was too frightening. There was no Sesame Street yet. You know, it was just too frightening a book. But probably my career was decided because I took that job in the library, and so it was decided because a teacher in college uh, decided that I should get a job at the library. And actually, she told the whole class, because Jill is so wonderful, I have assigned, I have given her name to the public library to do the storytelling and work in the children's room. And then she took me aside and said, and now you will take that job because I gave my word. And so <laughs> that probably decided my career. Sounds like it. I mean, it, it, I had been a theater major. I left theater because my cat was in a play. And it's just a long, funny story, but uh, my cat went behind all of the scenery and then used it as the bathroom. And the first night, my cat was a farm cat. You know, he, he wasn't used to all this whoopie doo and then, and then first curtain call, they took him out, and everybody was clapping. And, of course, he's a farm cat. He's got claws. He's going to catch mice. And so he scratched the leading lady and jumped out of her arms and ran away. And so I was pretty hated by the guy who was in charge of stagecraft and he was the only person who taught it and you had to have it if you were a major in theater and one of my friends said you'll never you'll never pass he's told us he'll never pass you so I changed from theater to English because I had always liked English too and at first I was in English education but to be honest um, I went I went to homecoming in Washington, D.C., where my boyfriend was going to George Washington University, and that was the week, I don't know if you remember this, Katie, but used to, some doctors came to the colleges, and they tested to make sure you were physically able to be a teacher, and all of the kids went through the physical exam the, weekend that I, the week that I was gone. And in, at Eau Claire? At Eau Claire, at a University of Eau Claire. It was Eau Claire State then. It mm -hmm. was largely a teacher's college. Um, and my friends all told me how ab abusive and nasty the doctor was, and you had to go make a special appointment to that doctor, so I just changed. I dropped education and became an English major. And then I had this wonderful teacher, um, Carl Andreessen. I had two wonderful political science teachers. The other one was named Dr. Gibbons, but he's not the famous Dr. Gibbons, but he had the same name. He used to sit up on top of the table with his legs crossed, cross-legged like a little Buddha, and lecture to us, and he was wonderful. But Carl Andreessen was Norwegian, he was an immigrant, and he taught constitutional law, among things, and um, he had been brought by McCarthy down several times during the hearings and when they were trying to, as, a, 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 he, as an un-American person. But he was smart enough that they never could get anything on him. And he would always 
get to go back to college he was and called teach. to testify Fantastic. yes and to explain himself because he was a foreigner you know and all of this had the accent to go with it yes and he was liberal and um, McCarthy didn't like liberal Wisconsin people so he talked about that because of them I took a second minor you had to have one minor and my minor was journalism it seemed easy I was working on the newspaper, seemed like the logical place. But then I did a political science minor, too, because I like these teachers so much. And um, I was on the newspaper in college, and I was active in Young Democrats, even though my family was all Republican. Um, I broke away because of Carl Andreessen and because of what I was learning in my classes. And um, I was very active in the um, Methodist youth group. Uh, but actually, um, college also changed my attitudes towards religion. It didn't make me a non-religious person, but it made me, uh, in world history, I did a paper on Zoroastrianism, and I realized there were lots of religions that were all the same. They all had this great Messiah who came, and they all had this story of creation, and um, because no one had bothered to tell me any of those stories. I found it upsetting that somehow I had been misinformed before. And I was always a very religious person. Um, one of my, but I tried all the churches out because my mom and dad let me. And so I went to the Unitarian Church for a while, and I went to the Episcopal Church for a while, and then I went to the Methodist Church because that's what my mom went to. And they had by the time I was a senior, they had a Japanese minister, uh, Reverend Saito, and I liked him. And actually, the man who was in charge of the youth group, I was, his name was Dr. Moore, and his wife, Ginny Moore, I met later because, and she said no, she didn't know me, but then she said, oh, I guess I do. Uh, she was the head of the cooperative Children's Book Center in Madison, Wisconsin, and we met at a conference. And uh, she we were, long after this, yeah. Huh? When we when we were at, when I was working and she was working, and she said, "I have to talk to you. I met you in another life, but I don't know where it is, and maybe it's not this life." And then she told me who she was and what she had done, and I said, "Well, your husband was in charge of the youth group, and they had a big impact on me too because we went." Um, that was during the times when people were going south and going other places to protest civil rights. And um, we went on a weekend. We didn't go south, but we went on a weekend bringing college kids together. And I can't say that I was a good trooper, but I met a young African-American male who I really liked, and we talked a lot. And he talked about how he had grown up in the Midwest and everything was fine for him until he was in high school. And then all these young women he had known before he was forbidden to take to dances or to see. And so I realized what segregation had done to people. And I suppose I should say that in high school, my parents let me date the, all the Jewish boys in my class. Nobody else dated them, but I dated them. They were all of them, too. And I, I dated them both. And, I, and, and so I, I came from a family that was pretty liberal in, in their attitudes, but um, Republican. My grandfather had been a county commissioner, commissioner in the Republican Party in Colorado, and the Republican Party was the president of Lincoln's party, and they looked upon it as, as Lincoln's party, not the Republican Party of today. Um, my cousins are still all Republicans. My dad died a Republican. My brother is a died-in-the-wool Republican, but my mother became a Democrat, and she loved Obama. She absolutely adored Obama. So. Um, she kind of was probably the big influence on me, even though I didn't know it at the time. You know, you don't know as a kid. But anyway, um, so when I was in college, I started as a theater major, then I went to English ed, and then I went to English, and I kept these two minors. I never finished the journalism minor, which is really kind of funny. You would think I would have finished that one. But um, things got, I was working two jobs now, and I was working for the newspaper, and I was working for the uh, library. And I quit the library job so that I could work in the dress shop. But then the director of the library 
went down to Madison, Wisconsin, and got me a scholarship. And he called me up and told me, I, you need to go to library school. You need to become a librarian. You need to, you, and so <laughs> it's sort of like that teacher, you know. Um, you will do you. this, yes. And I wasn't the best student in college. I wasn't the worst student, but I had taken logic because you had to take logic or philosophy. And I had taken the great thinkers in politics, and I had taken, you know, I had read all kinds of things with Dr. Gibbons, and I just didn't want to take philosophy. So I took logic not knowing it's based on math. And the guy would get up and do these equations, and I would watch him and think, oh my goodness, what is he doing? So I flunked that class, really, except that I went in to see him. My grandparents had come from Colorado, my mother's parents, to watch me graduate. I was the first college graduate, other than my mother's aunt, uh, sister. Uh, from the family, and um, my dad's mother was a school teacher, but that's when you could teach if you had, you know, ninth grade education. So I went to this teacher and said, am I going to graduate? Because if I'm not, I'm not going to march because I don't want to disappoint my grandparents. And so he said, and he tutored me every week. He tutored me for two hours every week, and he would try to get me to do the problem, and in the end he would say, well, it doesn't matter, Jill, this won't be on the test. And what happened was, he, the tests were scheduled for two hours, but he only gave us an hour and he didn't tell us. So I only got through half the test. He said, well, on this first question, you've got a C minus. And on this second question, you've got a D plus. I thought I didn't even know there was such a thing. And on the la next question, you've got an F minus, but you didn't answer to them. And I said, I didn't have time. And so he looked at him and he said, uh, the, these problems are all based on simple algebra. Why can't you do these problems? They're simple geometry and algebra. And I said, really? Oh, I was terrible in math in, college, in high school. I didn't know logic had to do with math. And he said, even though you saw the equations, you didn't know? And I said, no, I didn't know. And he said, well, you won't pass it if I make you take it again. So I'll just give you a D. And so I had a D. And, and uh, Margaret Monroe was in charge of the library school at that time in Madison, and I had had to go down and have an interview. I had this scholarship, but I had to do an interview, and um, she said to me, don't get any low grades. You have some C's spattered in your grades. No more low grades, otherwise I cannot validate that you could get a scholarship. Well, I got that D, but she gave me the scholarship anyway. <laughs> um, I, I worked, when I was working for the newspaper, I covered a lot of women's organizations. I went to their meetings and, and wrote them up. They were usually on the society page. And um, I became involved in the professional women's organization. Um, and so my senior year, that group nominated me for the young professional woman of the state of Wisconsin. And they, whoever was chosen, would go to the national conference. There would be one from each state, and actually the Virgin Islands and other places. And um, again, because I had good people behind me, I won. I mean, because my president went down, and she made a case for me, and I won. So I, my senior year, and I was engaged to a young man at that time. He was going to law school in the fall. So it was good for me to go to library school, because I'd be there in Madison, and, uh, but I had to take all of the undergraduate library classes, cataloging, um, reference desk, everything that summer. I had to take 12 hours that summer so that I could transfer those down because Wisconsin wanted you to have that. And um, I, so I missed a lot of those classes, and I did get the classes done and I did transfer. But the man who was in charge of the library and the library school at Eau Claire was named Jack Clark, Dr. Clark, and with an E at the end. And he was going to go and be the associate dean of the library school in Madison. So we both went down at the same time. And so again, I had a good mentor going with me, taking me uh, along. When I was the young professional woman, um, I, I had great roommates. I had a wonderful time. You wear these banners, it says, Miss Wisconsin, and you wear hats and gloves and everything, because that's the way it was in those days. And, 
And little kids would think we were beauty queens, and we certainly were not beauty queens, you know. <laughs> we were just ordinary girls. But uh, And I met Gaylord Nelson, and I had lunch with him, and I met Proxmire. So again, I, my liberal roots were being firmed up. And then I went to Madison, and I wasn't really involved in politics a lot, but um, I had a lot of international friends, because the library school had a lot of international friends. And, and then I broke up with my boyfriend, and um, I was still in library school. I was finishing up, and I met Bob. And at Madison? At Madison. He was in the graduate program in history, and, and we dated for a year. I gave him a year, <laughs> and then we got married. And, and uh, then I was done with library school, and I had had a chance to go, I had been asked to take a job at, in Baltimore at the Baltimore Public Library, and I was really toying with it until I met Bob because I didn't have any reason to have to stay in Wisconsin. But then I did, and I got the job as the head of the children's room in Madison Public Library. And I did because, not because I was so brilliant, but they were in desperate, dire need. They needed someone immediately, and I came with strong recommendations. And my scholarship actually was a research scholarship, so I had spent, and that's why Jenny Moore said, no, no, you, you couldn't be who you think you are. You, you didn't graduate from the library school. And I said, yes, I did, and I worked in the Capitol, because that's where the Children's Cooperative Book Center was at that time, up in the dome. And I actually probably mutilated the collection, because my job was to decide what books should be thrown and what books should be kept in the historical collection. Mm -hmm. And they gave me uh, the catalog from the Toronto Public Library and the children's collection that was in, in Canada. And they gave me reference books. I'm sure they gave me Megs and, you know, who, who knows. But, and the rule was if it wasn't in any of them, throw it. So I'm sure I threw gems because... You never know. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. And it was, the, the dome isn't very big, so you have to throw, sure. you know. But we also got all new books, and this affected my uh, later work with Tell, and also affected my work with the Teacher Resource Center at, uh, now. But anyway, we put all, we got all the book review journals, and we copied all of their, um, all of the, um, reviews and we put them we pasted them in the books and then we kept the books there I think we kept them for 12 months but we might have kept them for a year and a half and librarians and teachers could come read the reviews and when I worked at Madison Public um, I had to go over because there were several branches and so being in charge of the children's room I was if I didn't buy it they couldn't buy it so I had to know what books would we want to have? Sure. So I would go over and read the reviews and, and, and use that collection then. Uh, later, when Ginny came, the library school built a fine new building, and uh, the Cooperative Book Center is really nice now. I got to speak there once because a friend of mine taught there for a while, and so I saw how neat it was. But, but it wasn't the same as when I was there. It was different. And by the time I... I did, well, then I transferred from the children's room because there was an old lady there who didn't like me, and so I transferred to the bookmobile, and I was in charge of the bookmobile service, and then I had real power because I could buy anything I wanted, whether the main library bought it or not, and the librarians at all the branches would come with this wonderful art book, you know, and they'd say, we want to buy this, but we can't, so will you buy it and then give it to us? And I would because I... I you can't keep a lot of stuff on the bookmobile forever, so I bought a lot of books and kept them on the bookmobile for, you know, six Period weeks, and, and yeah, and then sent them off. Found a home for it. Yeah, and I had a fairly big staff there, a larger staff than I had in the children's room. I had, um, I had two drivers and then temp drivers, and um, at least two women working with me, uh, and so that was good for me. And I was also because of the journalism. I was the person who went to all the board meetings and then wrote the, the newspaper for the staff. So I was the staff journalist for them. So that was fun, and I, I enjoyed that. But by, about the time I did all the outreach, I went to the housing developments 
and I and I went on the bookmobile then because my people wouldn't go. They didn't want to do it. And I did story hours out at the libraries and um, there's some funny stories about that. One is Bob was washing the car one night, and he said, Jill, your kids played tic-tac-toe on our fender. And they did. They used a nail and just scratched it in. So I asked if I could take the bus to the housing development. And the director told me, no, my time was worth too much, and I couldn't ride the bus, so I had to take the car. And maybe I should get it insured with Lloyd's of London. I thought that was pretty funny because the bookmobile was you know, insured <laughs> with Lloyd's of London. I said, I don't think they want my car. And I, I, they had a program you could go to college. So I took a couple of uh, social work courses, which were good for me, for what I was doing. And the Margaret Monroe came down, and she was running a workshop with all of us. And she asked me if I would come back and do my PhD. But Bob was almost done. And we were moving on. And I actually you had... Got, you'd already gotten married? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and we were married the three years that he was doing his PhD. And he claims I told him to hurry, hurry. I don't remember that, but maybe I did. Um, so that he was here by the time he was 27 and teaching with his PhD. And I told her I couldn't. And I actually toyed with the idea of getting uh, a degree in urban planning because my interest... Of, with these kids and what was going on and, and that was a time when you sort of knew the cities were going to be in trouble because they were starting to be in trouble but Bob used the famous line he used the rest of our marriage all of our life and it always works with me he said I don't know what will happen to our marriage if you stay here and I go there I can't predict what will happen and I thought about it and I decided I liked our marriage better than getting another degree so I went with him and came here. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was really unhappy. I well, you, came, you came, what, to 1970? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was pregnant, but I didn't know it. But then I found out. But I, I wanted to work, I thought. I just I couldn't imagine not working. But because of the pressures I'd had at the public library, and, and you know, Katie, staff don't always get along. And because of the woman that, who was in the children's room, and also because of um, when I was in charge of the bookmobile, I had some real staffing problems with my drivers not always liking the young women. The young women were women in graduate library school. The men were, were working, working right, class yeah. men, and they didn't like getting orders from these young women. And they would complain to me, and um, they would, you know, they would tell on each other. And so because of that, and then one of my workers was the, the president of the union. And actually, I got along really well with him, but when I walked in, he said, we'll give you six months and we'll see who will be here. And so I really didn't want that stress again. So I didn't want to go to the library. And I had an interview here with the director, and he's not any of the... the inter in Purdue in Libraries? The Purdue Libraries. That would have been Moriarty? No. Yeah, I think it was Moriarty. Because he was still... Was uh, he kind of shy? Well, Moriarty... Um, was there someone before him who was? Well, he'd already, Moriarty was the director when I came. So, so he was here. Yeah. Okay. Well, he interviewed me, and I came in one of my spiffy little uh, Wisconsin outfits. And I, I said to Bob, it was this, it looked like a 1920s flapper outfit is what it looked like, because that was in, and I wore in clothes in Madison, and I was liberal. And so I wore this little outfit, and I came to the interview, and he didn't make eye contact either. And he said to me, we can put you in cataloging. And I came out, and I said to Bob, I am disgraced. They will only put me in cataloging here. And he said, well, what's wrong with cataloging? And I said, Bobby, you put people that you can't put on the desk in cataloging. You don't put, you know, you don't. And I'm not good at cataloging, so this is ridiculous. And so I did not take the job at first. Actually, Margaret Monroe, when she, again, a helper, when she found out I was going here and therefore not going to go to, on with the PhD, she said, I know the woman in charge of the school library program there. I will write to her and see if she will hire you. And I wrote, I wrote to Carolyn Whitenick also, and I wrote her this fancy, snazzy, 
a bad letter. I wrote to her and said, you don't have any children's literature or young adult literature. How can you possibly have a program for school librarians without it? If you want, I could come and teach them. And she wrote back and said, we do. It's called Media for Children. And we teach about film strips and films and other things, too. And she signed her letter, Carolyn. She said, I would like to meet you when you come to town. She signed her name, Carolyn. And she put a smiley face by the side. And I thought, what kind of woman is this? This is a crazy woman who doesn't know me, but she gives me a smiley face. But I came down, and I liked her. And she liked me. And the woman who was teaching at the time, her name was Virginia Wataki, I think was going back to library school to get her PhD. So Carolyn said I could teach the media for children until Virginia came back, if I passed a test. So I had to teach a couple times, three times, you know, for free. And she watched me, and then she did hire me. But I was hired as a visiting assistant professor because I was just visiting until Virginia came back. And then Virginia never came back, and I just, I just fell into that job. And um, at first I was half time. Well, at first I was hired by the course. I remember I was in Colorado one year. This was when I was very temporary. I never knew how much I'd be teaching. And somehow Carolyn, and she was so good at everything she did, somehow she found my parents' phone number in Colorado. And she called me up. It's two weeks before school starts. And she says, we need you to teach cataloging. Can you do it? And I said, oh, sure. Now, my cataloging class I had from Hassan, Hassan, Hassan. He was here from the Middle East at Madison on a year. And he taught us international cataloging rules, which had never been accepted anywhere. So I never learned LC catalog rules. He made us do LC cards, but we got smart. We knew he knew nothing about LC. That's why we were learning international. So we would go down and copy the cards out of the LC book. And of course, we did it back right, right? Because they're there. So unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't really learn cataloging. But I said, oh, sure, I'd be glad to. And I hung up and said to mom, the last thing I want to do is teach cataloging. I don't want to teach cataloging. But mom said, well, why did you say yes? And I said, if I say no, she'll find someone else, and I'll be out. So I always said yes to whatever came up. Um, uh, but so then I fell into that job, and, it, and I was a half-time assistant professor, and then I was told I needed to publish or I would perish. And I became very active in the Indiana Library Association. I became the editor of the scholarly journal when it was being reestablished and reset up. Mark Tucker was here then, and Mark did an article for me. And, um, and I did that, and then after Carolyn died, they took the library program out of the program, and they folded it into technology. And Bob Kane was the, the department head, and Bob Kane was always wonderful for me. He, he liked me and uh, thought I did good work, and he came and pulled me out of an elementary ed meeting and said, where do you want to be? I want you to be somewhere, where do you want to be? And I said, well, I want to be, uh, Pose Lan was here then. And Pose Lan was a dear friend of mine, but I knew Pose Lan, and I didn't want her as my boss. And so I said, I want to be in secondary ed, because Jim Barth was in charge of secondary. He said, OK, you can do that, because you teach young adults, and that'll be fine. And I said, and I want to be a gifted, because I had worked a lot with Feldhus and John Feldhus. And, and he looked at me and said, Joe, you can't be in everything. You have to pick a home. So I went into secondary. But then later I went more into elementary, because uh, we hired people in English who could teach the young adult. And, and then I pulled back from that. But um, yeah, so my career just kind of happened, Katie. It just, it just worked out. Just worked yeah. out. Uh, just Tell us a about the research. You did some stuff. A little bit on that, make a couple. Of I things. did do a lot of yeah. research. I I actually got so I liked doing research, and I liked. Um, I I again had lots of good luck. I was very active in the Children's Literature Association. I Carolyn gave me uh, that they, they were a brand new organization. She gave me their second annual and said, "I don't know what this group is, but you should go." And so I went, and um, 
and, the, and I first hated them because they were all these English people talking about literary theory, uh, using critical analysis, and it didn't seem like what you did in the schools. I now was working with schools and teachers, and that you know, teachers read books and ask you know what do you like, and sure. it wasn't the same at all. But I got caught. I went that first year just to see what it was like, so I went for two days, and the president, um, John Stott, and a, a woman who was maybe vice president. Uh, Aletha Helbig decided they liked me and so they wanted me to come back and they said what would it take to get me to come back and I said again stupid put me on the program I won't come if you don't put me on the program they'll give me money if you put me on the program otherwise I have to come on my own so they made a point of putting me on the program the next year and I think by the third year uh, I was asked to run for the board so I, I had a home and the longer you go, the more you understand. Sure, and um, the, the, the group never totally became unsnobbish. They, for many years, had the librarians, wherever they were, run the conference. And then they were angry at them when it didn't work out the way they wanted it to. One year, I remember saying in the board meeting, you can't do this. You can't have educators and librarians run your conference because you know they're good at that. And then not open the doors and let them give papers. You have to let them give papers. And at first, I didn't give papers because I came from that library. I gave workshops, you know, for people. But then little by little, I started giving papers. And my best friend in that organization became Perry Nodelman. And he's the top scholar in the, the organization. So that helped. I thought he was fascinating. And he jammed rooms. People would just, he'd have hundreds of people come to see him talk. And uh, we were at a, a I mean, it sounds funny, but I picked him up because he's, he, he looks sort of like Groucho Marx. He thinks he looks like Einstein, but, you know, he's this funny little guy. And he used to smoke like mad. And he was in a cocktail hour looking terribly nervous and terribly shy. And I knew he wasn't going to have good luck at making friends because he just wasn't able to do that. So I walked over and said, do you have anybody to eat with tonight? And he said, no. And I said, neither do I. Would you like to go out? for dinner we could talk and he said yes and I remember another woman Ruth McDonald said you picked him up and I said mm. well we ate in the restaurant in the in the lobby and he put me on the elevator but he didn't get on it so he saved his reputation <laughs> and then then we just became like sort of like yeah. sister and brother and when he was the editor of the journal I was the associate editor and I brought all the publications to Purdue and uh, because we started publishing books and we started publishing a quarterly that was a substantial thing. And I worked with Ron Smith in Twin City Typesetting and set up the format through Ron, whose significant other is now my secretary. So, and she was at that point a typesetter. So um, it was a good experience. And I would get bids and take them to the board meetings. And I started doing my own scholarship. And actually, um, everything kind of comes around in your life, I think in some ways. And I, one of my first things that I started studying was Howard Pyle. The, he did the Robin Hood and the King Arthur books, and he did the Garden Behind the Moon, which I just love, and he did other things. And I was fascinated by him because he did have female students. He had female art students. Uh, not when he moved the, the company uh, or his school out of Drexel and made it his own private school. Not then, but before that, he and, he and he still had women who he worked and mentored then. So, but he was sort of a male chauvinist pig because he had these guys he loved, and they and he's this hearty-looking guy, and he had six children, I think. I can't remember for sure, Katie. I'd have to count them, but none of them became artists. So, what do you do at home that separates you? you know, so far, why aren't your children inspired when you're inspiring all these young people? N.C. Wyeth was his student, and Wyeth trained his own children afterwards, and they were the artists that he wanted to train. Well, why didn't Pyle do that? So we had a sabbatical. I got tenure. I, uh, that's a long story, but I, I, I became a full professor, and I mean a, a full-time professor, assistant professor, and I got tenure. And then I went on sabbatical with Bob. And the kids were, Heather was a freshman in high school, and Beth was four years younger. So we lived in Delaware. 
And I went every day when the kids went to school, I went to uh, the Delaware Art Museum. And I worked on Howard Pyle. I, my dream was I was going to do a book about it. But the man left no personal letters. And there's lots of hearsay about him in that art museum. But nothing, it's like, now I'm telling you stories, but do I really remember everything 100% right, right? And there's nothing to vouch it. So I knew I couldn't write a book unless I wrote a book of criticism about him. And I really didn't know how you would approach him, because he was an author and an illustrator, formed his own school. So he's a very complex man. And if you start critiquing his literature, you have to critique his artwork and his book format. And um, very few people do that. He's not known at all where N.C. Wyeth is, because Wyeth basically did illustration. Yeah, right, and yeah. so um, I put that back in the back burner. And Bob kept saying, why don't you do a book on Howard Pyle? You've got all those notes. You did all that work. And I would give papers about him, but mostly critical papers at the Children's Literature Association yeah. or somewhere like that. And um, then when we both finished our last project, about now it's almost seven years, maybe six years, when we both published our last book, I said, OK, we're going to do a book on Howard Pyle. And so we did. And we lived through it. Uh, everybody says, oh, how did you write together? And there were humongous fights. I remember when we first started doing it, we decided we'd try to get an NEH grant, you know, uh, collaborative grant writing. And, but we got into some kind of argument. And I said to Bob, no, I would never write with you. I refuse to write with you. Forget it. I'll never do it. And he goes, oh, after we spent all this time, da 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 da. And he goes down in the, to his study. And he writes the prospectus for this grant. And he brings it up, and he lets me read it. And I think, damn, he's a good writer. <laughs> I should write with him. He's really good. So I changed my mind, and I did write with him. We didn't get the grant, but we, we did finish the book, and it's going to be published this spring, we think, or this summer, okay. by the University of Illinois Press. So we're really pleased. Let me stop for a yeah. minute. Um,